that we ask that by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, your word would be rooted in our hearts, understood in our minds, and lived out to the glory of Jesus. Amen. No nation, no church, no individual is guiltless. Without repentance and without forgiveness, there can be no regeneration. These bleak yet honest words of Bishop George Bell are etched into a stone in one of our chapels. Bell was a Christchurch scholar and tutor, and a very public friend of the German confessional church into and through the Second World War. His words relate to the catastrophic divisions of that war, but could equally apply to life within families, communities, churches, as well as nations. No one is guiltless. Without repentance and forgiveness, there can be no regeneration. But this process is not straightforward, either ethically or personally. For instance, George Bell was a vocal opponent of the Second World War bombing campaign, whereas others put up a strong case for its validity in the cause of ending the war. Today is Battle of Britain Sunday, when nationally we recall the close-run victory of the few. 3,000 courageous fighter pilots at the sharp end of a corporate endeavor at a vital moment in our national history. Yet 55,000 UK and Commonwealth aircrew lost their lives in the bombing campaign. Corporate unease about that campaign meant that medals were awarded only 40 years after the war and a national memorial constructed about 73 years late after the war. How do we handle the ambiguities and the guilt that accompany conflict? And how do we begin the process of regeneration to bring forgiveness and even reconciliation, truth with justice? These are questions of great complexity, too much for one short sermon, you'll be glad to know. But understanding is important so that individuals and communities can reconcile themselves to the past whilst learning for the future. The devastating humanitarian consequences of international conflict are highly visible on our screens, but we can transpose those consequences to our own local experience. Perhaps you know yourself the long-term consequences of dysfunctional family relationships, or the trauma and recovery needed from community conflict. Our readings today narrow our field of vision further to conflict within the community of faith. Yet in so doing, they also direct us to the ultimate source of learning and restoration. Jesus told the parable of the unforgiving slave to illustrate both a gift and a lesson. To Peter's suggestion of forgiving seven times, which was seemingly pretty generous, he gave the expansive answer of 77 times. For those who are interested, this was in direct contrast to Genesis chapter 4, where Lamech suggested 77 acts of vengeance was appropriate. In the following parable that Jesus told, the figure of 10,000 talents was a huge sum. 
deliberately so, and beyond one's wildest imagination. In other words, Jesus is saying that the first slave had been forgiven for something that he had no hope of repaying. Such is God's mercy to us. As the psalmist understood, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, long-suffering and of great goodness. He has not rewarded us according to our wickedness. It may be helpful for us to dwell on that realization, to appreciate that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As St. Paul wrote earlier in his letter to the Romans, and as George Bell indicates, no one is guiltless. By contrast in the story, the forgiven slave had no compassion at all on a fellow debtor who owed far less, a mere hundred denarii. In other words, a gift for us showing that forgiveness is possible, yet also a lesson that we should offer to others as God has offered to us. At the end of the parable and reinforced in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus highlights quite how significant this is, that we shall be forgiven to the measure by which we forgive others. Of course, it's not easy, though, to allow forgiveness to become part of our behavioral DNA, either individually or corporately. It's really difficult to forgive. And not just to forgive as a one-off, but to make it a permanent attitude, as advocated by the civil rights campaigner Martin Luther King. As he himself knew, the purest place to start is with God's mercy, etched on the heart of God and on the cross of Jesus. When you place alongside that the sobering reality of our own fallibility and need of that mercy, so we grow the potential to be reconcilers ourselves. St. Paul, the former chief prosecutor of the church, saw himself as a supreme recipient of God's generous mercy. Generous mercy is a phrase aptly used in our collect this morning, described as stemming from the burning fire of God's love. And Paul had experienced that burning fire, purging, refining, illuminating, and inspiring. And so transformed within, he could write with credibility as he does in our epistle today, live not for yourself, but for the Lord, the one who died for you and to whom every knee will bow. Mercy and sovereignty are uniquely combined in Jesus, to whom we are all accountable. So it was no wonder that in reference to some of the small internal issues of the church, Paul asked, why do you pass judgment on your brother and sister? Who are we to judge? That is not to say that argument and division within the church are not sometimes necessary or creative in our discussions around relationships and marriage, on issues of social justice and the environment. We need to maintain our integrity whilst fashioning our mission. Truth and relevance have to be worked out in every generation. Yet the manner in which we tackle differences within the community of faith can severely distract from its pastoral mission beyond its doors. The way we relate to each other should reveal how God relates to us. I suspect that many of us doubt our ability to forgive, 
even perhaps to forgive ourselves internally. Our opening hymn started, How shall I sing that majesty? 10,000 times 10,000 sound thy praise, but who am I? But the hymn also hints at a confidence based on God's generosity as we make that journey step by step. I shall, I fear, be dark and cold with all my fire and light. Yet when thou dost accept their gold, Lord, treasure up thy might. And the grace of Jesus is such that he does. Thanks be to God.